Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. It's Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Thanks for joining us for season seven of the podcast. We'll be off for Memorial Day and returning Wednesday, May 31st for the first episode of season eight. But first, a quick note about one of our other projects, Expert Insights. From the same team that has brought you the Public Health On Call podcast since March 2020, Expert Insights began as a daily newsletter rounding up everything we knew about COVID in that moment. Over the last three years, the newsletter evolved, and in 2023, the project won an Anthem Award for being a go-to public health resource. Framed by Bloomberg School researchers and rooted in science, Expert Insights informs readers about the most pressing public health topics. If you're not already, please consider subscribing to this twice-weekly resource. Visit publichealth.jhu.edu slash subscribe, or click the link in today's episode description and sign up today. Finally, some thank yous from this season of the podcast. Major thanks to Grace Fernandez for stepping in as producer while I was out on family leave, and to Annalise Winnie and Rachel Burvell for their work co-producing Public Health in the Field, the series on Black maternal health. Thank you also to our faithful team of interns, Kriti Baum, Hannah Bennett, and Caroline Wang. Finally, we'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for sharing your ideas and questions and for downloading this podcast nearly 10 million times. Keep writing us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu, and thank you for being part of this podcast. Today, a new national investigative report on the failures of the U.S. pandemic response. The report by the COVID crisis group finds that had the U.S. done as well as other wealthy nations, hundreds of thousands more Americans would be alive today. The director of the COVID crisis group and lead author of the report, Philip Zelikow, joins Josh Sharfstein on today's podcast. They talk about how public health was set up to fail, how blaming individuals distracts from appreciating a structural incompetence in government, and what needs to be done to learn the lessons of COVID. Let's listen. Philip Zelikow, thank you so much for joining me in Public Health On Call to talk about the book that was just published, Lessons from the COVID War. Glad to be with you, Josh. So this is not your first report about a national disaster. You led the 9-11 Commission. Tell us about how that experience led you to want to investigate what happened in COVID. Oh, well, I was knocked on the head and and conscripted into doing this. Um, I was recruited. Uh, um, A group of foundations thought, well, of course, there's going to be a national COVID commission on this enormous crisis to you know, figure out what went wrong. So then they asked me to explain to them how such a commission should be done. And I gave them a little talk and they said, okay, smart guy, we've now decided you should direct this group to create this commission. And they leaned hard on me to do this. And so I agreed to do it if I could get some smart people to help me. And Josh, you actually were kind enough to offer us a lot of help in, in the first months of our work. So we collected this extraordinary group of people, 34 people, for this commission planning group. Then it turned out, well, there's not going to be a commission because Congress and the administration didn't really want one. And we had done a a huge amount of work and felt we had a story to tell. And our group members just looked at each other and said, well, you know what? If they won't create the commission, we will just write what we think should be in the report and we'll write it plainly. Uh, without a lot of technical jargon. Uh, We won't dumb it down, but we will write it so anyone who wants to read it can understand it. And we'll cover everything from origins to warp speed. And that's the book that's now in bookstores everywhere. And it is uh, very clearly written. I think you succeeded very well on that. And and it does bring you back to the 9-11 Commission Report, which was also extremely well written. What other lessons did you take from the 9-11 Commission into this project? Well, actually, I thought the 9-11 episode, which was had all sorts of complications of its own, 
was intellectually easier, intellectually easier than this problem. This problem is much more sprawling, more global, and touches on all kinds of bodies of knowledge that are more difficult to summarize than was the case in the 9-11 episode, which in a way is just like a gigantic uh, true crime story um, on an international scale. And then you go through the different agencies and so on. So intellectually, this was harder. Intellectually, we had to combine our talents a lot more in order to get reliable insights and summarize them. Also, in this crisis, you had much more about all the different levels of government, federal, state, and local. And Josh, I mean, you've had experience literally at all these levels. And so you understand actually how hard it is to kind of pull a lot of that together and then try to boil that down into a narrative that cuts through all the stuff and gives people a clear account. Now, I remember my first interaction with with you on this project. It was like a two hour Zoom that we did where there were a lot of good questions asked and a lot of notes taken. How many of those did you wind up doing? We actually ended up talking to about 300 people in listening sessions like that. That from all walks of life, including some people outside of the United States. And then, of course, lots of research and other things. So you have all this information, you have to sort through it, and you're also doing it in an environment where there's some very strong and competing explanations of what went wrong. You know, there's one point of view, for example, that it was a major failure of public health, errors made at every turn, leading to so many deaths in this country. Another point of view is that public health couldn't do its job. It was set up to fail, some might say. Right. And um, it was cut off from taking actions that would have been more effective. How did you sort through that dichotomy? So a lot of people faced with this overwhelming trauma come up with narratives about blame. And so typically uh, Republicans have a blame narrative either focusing on China or on public health authorities, of whom they use Dr. Fauci as the poster child, or maybe some public health authority in their state they don't like. The Democrats, on their part, have a blame narrative, mostly blaming Trump. And look, this may be hard for some of your listeners who are supporters of President Trump to to accept, but I think anyone who really reads our report come away from it thinking, that probably President Trump should be nowhere near instruments of government again. We don't go out of our way, but you just if you just go through the story, I think that just becomes very clear. Yet, if you focus on Trump, for example, and you miss the whole structural reasons why we were going to have a hard time no matter who was president, and then that brings it back to the public health story. A common view is that, well, our politics is so divided and toxic, therefore public health couldn't do its job. In fact, our argument in the book is more that because public health couldn't do its job and didn't know what to do and was visibly flailing, that void is the opening through which all the toxic politics could then flow in and dominate the narrative. So that's a different approach. Then, okay, so now you're saying that public health failed. Um, Well, in many respects, it did. But here's then, rather than turn CDC into, you know, another version of the victim narrative or public health, the main argument of the book really is that we went into this crisis with a public health system that was set up to fail. And isn't it ironic then that having taken that system into a crisis where it was set up to fail, we then blame it for the failure? That seems fundamentally unsound. We brought a system fundamentally designed for the 19th century into a 21st century national emergency, and it floundered. Well, of course it did. We expected the CDC to do things the CDC was never built to do, trained to do, and had no authority to do. So let's talk about some of those, that issue of being set up to fail. Maybe start with an inadequate data system to track infectious disease. Right. That would be an obvious one. What what else do you put in that category? Well, there was, as you've observed, just in general, you start with a system that's underfunded and undermanned. 
it's a system that is extraordinarily fragmented into hundreds of state, territorial, and local agencies, which often have different kinds of authorities and are very different from each other, with actually no real strong national executive guidance as to how to cope with a national emergency. So hundreds of fragmented authorities, underfunded and undermanned, with all kinds of authorities in their own states and counties, with appointment methods, which often date to the 19th century, in which case some of these entities were not individually very competent with their heads appointed in very political processes, contrasted with other places where the heads were extremely capable and personally quite dedicated, but functioning in institutions that were using fax machines to collect and transmit data. So you've just got that entire spectrum. And then you're facing this enormous national emergency, and then they can't get the support they need from the national government, which doesn't have the authority or the funds or the know-how, actually, in knowing what to do. I mean, you put a public health authority in the situation, say, of, okay, what do we do about schools? I mean, who's going to then do the trade-offs on, well, here are the educational and psychological losses. Here are the losses for working moms if we close schools. So we have to accept a level of risk if we keep the schools open. What are the toolkits we use then to keep schools open? And then the decisions on whether to keep schools open aren't made by health departments, by and large. They're mainly made by the school authorities. The national guidance is kind of risk-averse and impractical. They're not giving the local authorities the toolkits that they need. And here's the scientific insight about ventilation, how the disease spreads. Here are the free N95 masks in the thousands. Here are the protocols for how to use rapid antigen tests so that you can keep people out of the schools who might be sick. With the whole goal of allowing us to reopen in a situation where teachers and students don't feel perfectly safe, but they feel they're about as safe going to school as they would be if they didn't go to school. And actually, this is what happens in most of the affluent countries in the world, but it's not what happened in America because our institutions uh, were so fragmented and incapable. So you have a broken public health system, inadequate, dispersed, trying to cope with this major national crisis and the federal government not able to provide the support that they need around the country to really be able to address the challenges facing them. Yes, that's right. Uh, I mean, people perceive the CDC as a national public health agency. And indeed, as we say in the report, the CDC has a little bit of this image of itself as being this thing. Uh, In reality, it is not such a thing. We don't have a national public health agency. The CDC has no executive authority around the country or capability. It also doesn't even have the processes involving the stakeholders to make serious decisions about schools, to uh, implement practical toolkits that would improve ventilation systems. And then the CDC also got some of the science wrong in the bargain. And by the way, the CDC wasn't the entity that could buy uh, tests at scale and distribute the protocols for how to use tests if they had them. Right. Now, the report uses a word a lot, which is incompetence. You know, we had an incompetent government in the moment of national need. Talk about who that word gets applied to. How, How did you think that the response was incompetent? Some of the members of our group were themselves part of the public health community in the crisis. I mean, Charity Dean had been the head of her county's public health and then became the deputy head of California's public health effort, uh, for example. And she feels quite passionately about uh, what we say in the report. And she accepts those incompetence terms, but it's not necessarily individual incompetence. Competence means, well, did this person know how to do something? Did they know how to do what needed to be done? Good people can be incompetent. Also, people who are individually competent at knowing how to do their jobs can be in situations that are institutionally incompetent. That is, as an institution, as an organization, you don't have the authority or the tools or the training to be able to do these things. And therefore, your institution is incapable. It does not know what to do. 
Uh, let me just give you another illustration of this. Even when we started getting some of the drugs right, like take Paxlovid, which is a widely known now drug for treating COVID. It was made available too late for reasons we discussed in the report, but it eventually was widely available by uh, 2022. But even in 2022, even to this day, we have Paxlovid available at scale, but we don't really give very good operating guidance to doctors for how to use Paxlovid for maximum effectiveness. The same was true with the monoclonal antibodies we had earlier, which often, by the way, has to be combined with early testing for Paxlovid to be most effective. So since we didn't actually give people the training and the guidance for how to use Paxlovid effectively, even though this drug is available, most COVID patients in the United States to this day are not actually being treated with the drugs that are already available to help them. Right. I think that is a terrific explanation of what you mean by incompetence, because I think it also illustrates the point you made earlier that it's pretty easy to throw blame. It's harder to think about the underlying systemic failures of which there were many. Um, in COVID and what's necessary to fix them. I do want to ask you how you thought politics interfaced with this. So recognizing that for multiple reasons, including being set up to fail, not having the right systems, not having the right evidence, there were errors within public health. There were failures in competence by your definition within public health. You also had moments when public health agencies weren't allowed to talk. You had vilification attacks on public health officials. How is that part of your story? Yeah, well, what happened then is it was clear the public health entities were being overwhelmed. So you had best cases and worst cases. And the worst cases, they get overwhelmed and everyone blames them for all the bad things and these restrictions because absent good toolkits, they were left with doing nothing or using blunt instruments, which angered people. And then they get blamed either way. And you get this really toxic environment in a situation where historically people tend not to like public health decrees anyway. And this has always been true in American history. So those are your worst case stories. And we do have divided politics. And we did have politicians who took advantage of the crisis to blame elites, all of that. I do want to call out that there were actually a lot of best cases because this is, it seems like such a dismal story. It makes people shrug their shoulders and makes them sad. Our book actually points up a lot of really good cases. What happened? Yeah, they were overwhelmed. So then what a lot of places did is they created ad hoc setups, usually involving the governor and business community and Metro Medical Centers and the emergency management agencies. They would then form some kind of ad hoc group of people in various states that then would create kind of a improvised governance for this in which the public health folks would actually play a really good role. For the first time, the private hospitals would be opening up their data to the public health departments on a daily basis because they were all pooling their information together. They were all coordinating their actions of what to do. There were cases where this actually worked really well and outstanding civil servants did terrific work. Right. We want to call that out for people to notice because that's a lesson that we don't want to lose as well. We want people to remember what worked in the crisis so that we can try to institutionalize some of that. Public health and healthcare systems should work together much better than they do. Yeah, we certainly have had on the podcast some health officials who have told some remarkable stories, both about coordination with the healthcare system, as well as um, efforts to really focus on inequities that emerged pretty pretty early in the pandemic and, and work with community uh, organizations to address them. Let's talk about uh, what this means for the future. You have a, a pretty brutal diagnosis. You know, you have a diagnosis of underfunding, under preparation, organizational disarray, complicated by the polarization in the country. Where do we go from here? I'm really glad you asked that, Josh, because I think for a lot of your listeners, they hear this and they think, oh, systemic problems. And again, it just makes their shoulders sag and this is just one more systemic thing we can't fix. Actually, 
Charity Dean, who I mentioned earlier, said she was rereading the book again and actually found it kind of empowering because when you go through the report, you realize, oh, I don't like need a magic wand to fix a lot of these things. In fact, I think quite a lot of this can be done without a giant act of Congress, without creating some giant new federal agency, that actually with existing structures and a lot of existing authorities and a lot of existing money, a lot of this is low-hanging fruit that we could really do with existing technology if we just understand what it is we need to do and use our existing resources to do it. So this is not a hopeless task. It's kind of uh, inspiring in a way that, ah, this, this is doable stuff. I'll give you an example, just connecting the data in public health and healthcare. In one of our chapters, we actually go into some detail, kind of practically speaking, about how this could be done. We argue that you probably can't connect the private electronic health record system directly to public health departments for various reasons. But I say that we point out there are precedents in other industries where you create a third-party entity that can pool private sector data, which is is superb in many cases, and then make that available for public use. We do this in aviation safety and electric utilities work. This doesn't require any brand new technology. It doesn't require a huge amount of money. It just requires a vision of what to do and how to do it during the crisis. Someone you know, Mark Lipsitch, uh, working with some folks at CDC, even prototyped a new information sharing approach in Southern California, working with the Kaiser Permanente system out there that did a really good job of providing us with some advanced warning and virus tracking. I'm just using this as just one little example of the what to do part. If people will get this, they'll get the story. They'll see a lot of the things they can do at all levels. I agree with you that there are things that can be done at all levels um, and it's important to make progress where we can. I wonder though whether it's a little easy to give people the sense that this can be done with all the resources we have today, with all the, you know, historic underfunding, the computers, the fax machines, the, you know, the the various uh, gaps that are there. You know, there are does require, and your book calls for some governmental reorganization, there is, I think, inarguably the need for more resources to get some of these systems stood up, even as I would agree with you that there are things that are within reach that that could be done as well. Yeah, that's fair. It's hard when you write a report like this because you don't want to make things sound hopeless and requiring a huge, you know, new commitment. On the other hand, there's the the other danger of just making it seem like, you know, it's all within reach. And that could lead people just to think, well, if it's not happening, you know, we should just blame the people who are up there trying to make it work. How do you thread the needle there? Here's the way I do it is, and I, I have a little experience in trying to get change done at the national level. If you go to Congress and say, let's just pour a lot of new money into these old vessels, which to many members of Congress are somewhat discredited vessels. If you just go to them and say, let's just pour a lot of money into all of that, it's you're just going to fail. There are reasons why these things are underfunded. Actually, we spend a lot of money, much of it somewhat inefficiently in our healthcare system, and then spend very little on public health, as you know really well. I think you've got to come to folks and say, we have a different conception of what we're going to do and how we're going to organize things to do it. And we want you to invest in this new concept then I think that argument has a chance. And I've seen this kind of argument work before. An example you know, in the beginning of the 2000s, no one on earth thought that George W. Bush was going to be the man to create a tremendous new public health program for AIDS in Africa. Yet it was his administration that did that. Now, so what happened? There was a new concept for how to do that, that offered some new promise Uh, not just using the old structures. The Bush administration sold that concept to Congress. Congress funded it with billions of dollars and millions of lives have been saved. I think our report in a way offers people some of the tools they can use to try to make that happen again for the United States. 
Well, you know, I do teach a course at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health about crisis. And one of the key questions is, when do you get change after a crisis? And one of the ingredients in change is having a roadmap that people can understand and a story that explains what went wrong. And I think this is a a compelling story you have put together. And along with other reports that are Talking about the the deficits in the public health system, I think it's part of a roadmap for progress. And I, it also, I'll tell you, the third ingredient is often a popular push for change. And so we're we're going to have to see um, how many people buy this book, how many people get engaged, and uh, what winds up happening after this awful, awful experience we've had. Well, so many people went through this trauma that I think they might find it healing a little bit to understand what they've endured. Well, thank you so much for for coming, sharing not only your explanations of of the book and its process, but your uh, path and ideas for the future. Thank you, Josh. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.